Mr. Beat presents Presidential Elections, elections in American, American History. history. <laughs> the 10th presidential election in American history took place from Tuesday, October 26th to Thursday, December 2nd, 1824. It's one of my favorite elections to look at because it was so unusual and fascinating. First of all, it's important to note that this was the first election in which white men came out in droves to vote. It used to be that only rich white men could vote in elections, but more and more laws now made it so that poor white men could vote because property ownership was no longer a requirement, so remember that later on. Okay, so James Monroe had a relatively smooth tenure as president and decided not to seek a third term, keeping the two-term tradition. His vice president, Daniel D. Tompkins, was lucky to be re-elected back in 1820 because a lot of fellow Democratic Republicans didn't like him. In 1824, he was still in no shape to run for president because many still didn't like him. He had mismanaged his money and had a horrible debt, and he suffered from alcoholism and just overall poor health. Tragically, he died just three months after leaving office. There was still only one major political party at the time, the Democratic Republican Party. Yet there was a power vacuum within the party. Because of this, a flood of candidates rushed in all wanting to be president. The election ended up being more about each candidate's personality and regional rivalries because each candidate agreed on most of the major issues. Think of the primary elections and caucuses of today within political parties to get their nominee. That's basically what this presidential election was, except they couldn't agree on who would be nominated and therefore president. There were originally six Democratic-Republican candidates who stood out. There was Smith Thompson of New York, who was the Secretary of the Navy. Seeing he had no chance against stiff competition, he ended up withdrawing from the race. Next up was John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who was the Secretary of War. He also dropped out of the race later when he realized he didn't stand a chance. That left four other candidates who did stick it out. William H. Crawford, the Secretary of the Treasury from Georgia, had actually been nominated by a caucus of a minority of the Democratic-Republican members of the U.S. Congress. However, the rest of Congress viewed the caucus as elitist and undemocratic, so they ignored it. Next up was Henry Clay, the well-known and well-respected Speaker of the House from Kentucky. He probably would have received his party's caucus nomination if he had wanted it, but he thought the caucus process was not the best way to elect presidential candidates. John Quincy Adams, oldest son of former President John Adams and Secretary of State from Massachusetts, tended to have support from many former Federalists. Finally, there was Andrew Jackson, the War of 1812 military hero, former governor and senator from Tennessee, who many viewed as a champion of the, quote, common man. Like I said, with the exception of maybe disagreements over tariffs and the government's role with infrastructure, these candidates agreed on most issues. This election was about personality and supporting the candidate voters could relate to the most. It was very much a regional election. Crawford had much support in parts of the East, Clay had support in the West, Adams had support in the Northeast, and Jackson had support pretty much all over. Because the election was highly contested, there was heavy campaigning from all sides, with the exception of Crawford, who suffered from a stroke due to a bad prescription. You heard that right. However, back then candidates usually sat on the sidelines while their supporters did most of the campaigning anyway. In addition to the usual forms of campaigning, a bunch of parody songs popped up to support candidates, most notably Hunters of Kentucky, a parody of the song The Unfortunate Miss Bailey. Weird Al Yankovic would be so proud. Did I mention the vice president candidates? There were a lot. Let's see, we originally had Albert Gallatin, who was nominated by that congressional caucus that didn't count. Officially on the ballot come October were Nathan Sanford from New York, Nathaniel Macon from North Carolina, Martin Van Buren from New York, and the aforementioned John C. Calhoun, Henry Clay, and Andrew Jackson. And here are the results. Well, the results were inconclusive. There was no clear winner. Andrew Jackson received 99 electoral votes, more electoral votes than any other candidate, but he did not receive the majority electoral votes needed to win the election, which was 131. John Quincy Adams came in second with 84 electoral votes, Crawford third with 41, and Clay fourth with 37. 
John C. Calhoun became the seventh vice president in American history after receiving 182 electoral votes. Good thing he dropped out of the presidential race, know what I'm saying? But who would be president? Well, the answer was in the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, which said the House of Representatives would decide who would be president if no candidate received a majority of the electoral vote. Only the top three candidates would be considered, so this left out Henry Clay. Jackson, Adams, and Crawford remained. Remember, Henry Clay was Speaker of the House and extremely influential in Congress. Clay hated Andrew Jackson. In January of 1825, he told a friend, quote, I cannot believe that killing 2,500 Englishmen at New Orleans qualifies for the various difficult and complicated duties of the chief magistracy." unquote. Clay used his influence to convince more people to vote for Adams, whom he agreed with more on issues anyway, instead of Jackson. When the House voted on February 9th, 1825, John Quincy Adams was the winner, becoming the sixth president of the United States and the first of two presidents who was the son of a former president, the other being George W. Bush. Andrew Jackson was shocked. After all, not only did he receive the most electoral votes, but he received the most votes total, with four 41.4% of the popular vote compared to Adams getting 30.9%. It was the first and only presidential election in which the candidate who received the most electoral votes did not become president, and the first of four presidential elections in which the candidate who won the popular vote did not become president. After the election, word got out that Clay struck a deal with Adams in which Clay would become Secretary of State if Adams was elected, a position Clay wanted because Adams and his three predecessors had all served as Secretary of State prior to becoming president. Sure enough, after Adams was elected, he appointed Clay his Secretary of State. Jackson and his supporters were enraged, calling the apparent deal between Adams and Clay a, quote, corrupt bargain. While Clay denied the charges, the damage was already done. The so-called corrupt bargain would haunt Adams' presidency the next four years. I'll see you for the next election, buddy.